Okay, welcome back after the break. Um, we uh, began by looking at um, uh, that, the, that the Holy Spirit is. Who is the Holy Spirit? God, yes. And um, we, uh, we, we looked at the word Trinity and we are looking at the Trinity in action in different passages, in different verses in the Bible. Okay. So, um, during the Okay. Yeah. Can all of you online students please mute your mics? All of you please mute your mics. Oh. Have one of the methods mm. that God is is this Mawa, Maui. Can you okay. please mute your mic, okay. please? If you mute your mics, there won't be any problem for the other students to hear. Maui Ma Wangi, can you please mute? Thank you. Rogers, yes. Yeah, all of you have muted your mics. Yeah, please don't unmute your mics now, otherwise, you want uh, the other students will find difficulty in hearing. Thank you. Okay. Is that fine? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So um, we'll move on. We looked at Revelation chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. Some other scriptures is 1 John 5, 7. We already read that. Okay. Um, three more. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. And John chapter 14, verse 16. So can three different people quickly read that? In-person students, please. Quickly, Second Corinthians is in your notes, I think, right? Is it there in your notes? No, no. Second Corinthians thirteen fourteen. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Okay. So here again, it's talking about the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, communion of the Holy Spirit. Someone else can read First Peter 1, verses 1 and 2, please. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Amen. So here can we see Trinity in action. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Father is mentioned there. Jesus Christ is mentioned there. And also uh, the Spirit, sanctification of the Spirit. So one of the role of the Holy Spirit is to sanctify us, to cleanse us, to set apart, set us apart for the work of God. Okay. Last verse, John chapter 14, verse 16. Can somebody read that, please? You can pass the mic here. And, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsel to be with you forever. And I will pray to the Father, that is God the Father, and he will give you another helper. And who is the I here? Jesus. Jesus is saying, I will pray to the Father. He will give you another helper. The helper is a capital H. It's not talking about human helper. And he may abide with you forever. So who is the Holy? how is the Holy Spirit referred to here? Helper. And as someone as he may abide in you forever. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, as New Testament believers, the Holy Spirit will dwell in us for, dwell in us for ever. Amen. So you and I as New Testament believers are very privileged as church today are very privileged because when the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us or lives in us, he will live in us for ever but in the old testament the people in the old testament were not so privileged like you and i because you will study about the work of the holy spirit in the old testament 
in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon certain individuals for a certain period of time to fulfill certain assignments that God has given them. When the assignment is fulfilled, the Holy Spirit would leave them. Okay, But that was even right up till Jesus' time, till Jesus died and rose again. But after Jesus died and rose again, all of them experienced the permanent indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit dwells in us forever. He never leaves us. Amen? So aren't you and I privileged? Yes. Okay, so you can thank God for that. So one thing that you can thank God is that the Holy Spirit dwells in us forever. The Holy Spirit is not on just on few of us. But if you're born again, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in you. When you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, the, the Holy Spirit comes and fills you with his power. Okay. Any questions from the online students, in-person students? Online students, sorry, you have to type your answers and post it on the chat. In-person students, any questions? I know you'll have a lot of questions, uh, but, you know, hold your horses, so to say. You know, you would learn more about the Holy Spirit and then you'll have much more clarity. Okay. Any questions otherwise? No questions, okay. In-person students, I'm assuming there's no questions. I can't see anything on the chat. If anyone wants, you can post your questions on the chat. Okay, if there are no questions, we'll move on to lesson two, the person of the Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit. We said the Holy Spirit is a person. Okay, the Holy Spirit is God. And how, why do we say the Holy Spirit is God? Oh, sorry, Charles, I can't get your question. You're saying, why is the Holy Spirit reference? I mean, why is the Holy Spirit what? What reference you need? Can you give me some more clarity, Charles? I can give you the reference only when you give me clarity about the question. You said, why is the Holy Spirit? That's an incomplete question. Can you type it out clearly, please, for me? Okay, why is the Holy Spirit referred to as He if He has no form? Okay, good question. So we're looking at that now. Okay, we're looking at why is Holy Spirit referred to as He? You have to put a capital H for that because He is God. You put a small H for when you're talking about human beings. But why is the Holy Spirit just referred to as He when He has no form? Is because even though the Holy Spirit is God, He has a person. That's why we said Trinity means one God who eternally exists in three persons. Okay? So that is why He is referred to as a He, because He is a person. And he refers or relates to us as a person. If God did not relate to us as a person, we would never be able to comprehend and understand God. Okay? Yes, where's the mic? Uh, Pastor, this question might be funny. Uh, okay, so the Holy Spirit doesn't have a form. And but he is a person. So because the Holy Spirit is person, we call him he. Why not she? <laughs> because a person like you can refer Good question. To your... Yes. He, um, does um, God the Father have a form? Uh, uh, is God the Father a spirit being? Yes. But we see that he has a form. He has eyes. You know, it talks about God has eyes, he can see, he holds us in the palm of his hands, he's engraved us in the palm of his hands, he upholds us with his righteous right hand, you know, he has a mouth, he can speak. Why? Because God is basically relating to us as persons, so he relates to us as a personality, as a person. Why isn't God referred to as she? Because of the context, you know, um, if you look at uh, the Old Testament, basically relating to the Jews, and um, you know, 
in the Jewish customs or even in our Indian context or in any context, who is uh, uh, the, uh, 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 the authority? It's man, right? Because basically because of fall, it's, it's a man. And also in God's governmental structure or God's governmental structure, so to say, yes, there are scripture passages that says, for God, there is no Jew nor Gentile, uh, slave nor free man or woman, all are one in Christ Jesus. But yet, why is this structure? Why, where, why is this hierarchy? Because God in his sovereignty has established a governmental structure or a governmental order so in the church it is the pastors at home it is the the man okay the husband who's the head of the home so god has his governmental authority and structure and so also in this there is a governmental authority and structure so it is not woman it is man so he's referred to as he hope that helps does that help okay um in the Old Testament, Holy Spirit came to them as angel. Um, uh, no, the Holy Spirit did not come as an angel, but whenever we see, uh, you know, angelic beings, it, it basically refers to, uh, the, you know, it, it talks about Jesus, the Son of God, you know, the epiphany, we call it, uh, that comes, angel, uh, that is basically referring to as Jesus in when the angel comes to Abraham and speaks to him, it's um, it's uh, God, the, the son who comes. Okay. Another question here is, um, the lamb is revealed as having seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Here, seven spirits is referred to what? Whether it's the Holy Spirit. Yes, it is referred to as the Holy Spirit. But the the number seven is in in the bible is symbolic of something that is or represents something that is complete or something that is perfect so here uh, the seven spirits of god could it be seen as a way of expressing the totality of the holy spirit the totality of the holy spirit's power and his presence rather than just referring to seven distinct spirits it's not seven distinct spirits. Um, the question here is what we read last in Revelation chapter 5, verses 6 and 7, where it says, you know, the seven horns and the seven spirits, and it says the seven spirits of God. So the word seven in the Bible basically represents totality or completeness. So here, when we talk about the seven spirits of God, it's seen as a way of expressing the totality of the Holy Spirit's power and presence, rather than referring to seven distinct spirits. Okay. okay. Thank you, Sobhagya. Good question. And Elkanah says, in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came to them as angel. Okay. Um, no, the Holy Spirit came as a spirit being, not as an angel. Wherever we see uh, the angel of God, where it's talking more about the Son of God, Sometimes the angels of God came, but sometimes it was more like the uh, epiphany manifestation of the Son of God. Jeevan says, while we are praising, we often say, Holy Spirit, come to me. There is a song in Nepal that we sing which says, Holy Spirit, come to me and take me to Christ. I think there's a Hindi version of this song too. My question is, how biblically accurate is it to say, Holy Spirit, come to me? If the Holy Spirit is living in us, why do we need to say, Holy Spirit, come to me? Yeah, good question. Basically, because people are ignorant of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. They don't know that the Holy Spirit is residing in them, is living in them, is dwelling in him, them. So they're saying that the Holy Spirit come upon me. Or even when we say, Holy Spirit, come upon me, even if people know that the Holy Spirit is dwelling in them, they may basically be, uh, be referring to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So when we use the word anointing of the Holy Spirit, we're basically talking about two Ps, the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. So basically, when we say anointing of the Holy Spirit, we're saying the presence of the Holy Spirit, and we're saying the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're basically asking the Holy Spirit to come and fill us afresh with his power and his presence. So it's okay to say, Holy Spirit, come fill me. 
uh, we are basically saying, come Holy Spirit, come in all of your power and your uh, presence. We see this happening even in the New Testament. When the disciples were baptized in the Holy Spirit, it says they were uh, filled with the Holy Spirit again. If you look at various references in the book of Acts, in various instances it says they met together and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Spirit. So it's okay to say, come Holy Spirit, fill me, because you're basically saying, come in your renewed power and your anointing and fill me. Does that, that uh, help, G1? Did I answer your question? Yes, no, you can put a thumbs up. Okay, thank you, G1. Okay, there's another question from Sri Raj, Isaiah chapter 11. Was is it 23 or Isaiah chapter 11 was 2 to chapter 3? Can you give me more clarity, please? Because two to you three. put the colon after 11 after 2. two so to is three. it 23 or just 2 or is it verses 2 and 3? 2 and two three. To 3. Okay. So Isaiah chapter 11 verses 2 and 3. Okay, so all of you in-person students also can turn to Isaiah chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. It says, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. Yeah. So here it's talking about the Holy Spirit, because if you look at the Spirit of the Lord, it's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of, uh, will rest upon him. Who is the him here? Jesus. The Spirit of the Lord will, or the Holy Spirit will rest upon Jesus. It's basically it's one of the prophecies concerning Jesus. So when Jesus comes, the Holy Spirit will rest upon him. The Holy Spirit will fill him. And it talks about the spirit of wisdom and understanding because the Holy Spirit, and here it's not a small S, it's, talk, it's a capital S. So it's talking about the Holy Spirit, who is a spirit of wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon Jesus, Holy Spirit will fill Jesus with counsel, wisdom, might, understanding, knowledge, and the fear of the Lord. So we can also ask the Holy Spirit to fill us with counsel, wisdom, knowledge, understanding, and the might and the fear of the Lord. Okay. So did that answer your question, Sri Raj? All good questions. Okay, yes. So we'll move on to chapter two if there are no more questions. No more questions. We'll move on to chapter two. Um, so in chapter 2, we will look at the person of the Holy Spirit, okay? So we saw that the Holy Spirit is God, okay? And because he's God, he has no form or shape. But why do we say that the Holy Spirit is God? Is because he has the nature, the attributes, or the characteristic that makes God, God, okay? Okay. So what are some of the nature or the attributes that make God, God? Omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, eternal, sovereign. Okay. So we look at various scripture passages. The first one we look at omnipresent. What is the meaning of omni? Present everywhere. Yeah, omni means all, all present, present every, everywhere. Omnipresent means what? Omnipotent means all powerful, omni, all, potent, powerful. Omniscient means what? All knowing, yes. All knowing. So we look at various scripture passages where it talks uh, one scripture passage for each where it talks about uh, Holy Spirit has the nature and the attributes of God. So if you're saying that Holy, if somebody says, hey, prove to me that Holy Spirit is God. So you have to take them through all of, walk them through all of these scripture references. 
The first one is omnipresent, all present. That means he's present everywhere. Okay. How do we know that Holy Spirit is present everywhere? When can some of one of you please read Psalm 139, verse 7, please? Psalm 139, verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Who has the mic? Can somebody read, please? Psalm 139, verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Yeah, you can read 8 and 9 as well. If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. So here is talking about whose spirit? Man's spirit? The Holy Spirit. How do we know it's the Holy Spirit? Capital. Yes, capital S. Verse 7. Where can I go from your spirit so the psalmist says there's nowhere i can go whether i go to the heavens you are there if i go to hell you are there if i go on in the uttermost parts of the sea the bed of the sea the ocean even there your right hand is will hold me fast and your right hand shall lead me so what is it saying here wherever we go the depths of the sea the depths of the ocean the depths of the world Heaven, hell, earth, anywhere. Who is there? The Holy Spirit is there. Okay. The next one is that the uh, Holy Spirit is, we're trying to prove Holy Spirit is God. Okay. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. Look at what Luke chapter 1 verse 35 says. Can you please read please? Luke 1 35. The angel answered and said unto her, the Holy Ghost shall come upon you. And the power of the highest shall overshadow. Therefore, also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Yes, the Holy Spirit is all powerful. How do we know that? It's the power of the Holy Spirit that helped Mary to conceive. Okay, Jesus in her, in her womb. The uh, the Holy Spirit is all knowing. He's omniscient. Can one of you please read First Corinthians chapter two? Verses 10 to 11, please. Anyone? First Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 to 11. But God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things you, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man? Save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, things of God know no man but the spirit of God. Okay, I'll read that. Thank you. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. So, all of you are sitting here in my class. So, I think I am assuming all of you are listening to me. But your spirit knows whether you are listening to me or you are somewhere else. Okay? So, it's what your spirit knows what you are thinking, what you are feeling. Okay, what you are understanding, right? So the spirit of man knows the spirit of what, what, the man, what the person is thinking, okay, analyzing, understanding, and all of those things. In the same way, God has revealed things to us, but who has known everything is the spirit of God, okay? It's the spirit of God who knows the things of God, who searches the things of God, and it's the Spirit of God who reveals the mind of God to us. So who reveals the minds of God to you? It's the Holy Spirit. Who reveals the plans and the purposes that God has for your life? It's the Holy Spirit. Who reveals what you should do in your spe specific situation or circumstance? Who reveals the heart and mind of God to you? It's the Holy Spirit. Because it's only the Holy Spirit 
who knows the heart and the mind of God. And it's the Holy Spirit that reveals the heart, the mind, the plans, the purposes, the thoughts of God to your spirit, man. And that is how you can know. So we know that the Holy Spirit is omniscient. He's all-knowing because he knows everything about God. Okay. There's a question here from Joanne. Who can phantom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? Who did the Lord con con consult to enlighten him? And who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the right path of understanding? Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13 to 18. Yes. So yes, this is Isaiah 40, verses 13 to 18. So what's your question, Joanne? Are you saying... Uh, are you just giving this verse as a verse that the Holy Spirit is all omniscient? Yes? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Okay. So another verse that our online student has presented is Isaiah chapter 40, verses 13 and 18, which also proves to us that the Holy Spirit is omniscient. Yes, there are numerous verses in the Bible where we can pull out and show that the Holy Spirit is omnipresent, omnipotent, and omni. Another scripture passage where we can see the Holy Spirit is God is in Acts chapter 5. So all of you please turn your Bibles to Acts chapter 5 verses 3 and 4. Please open your Bibles to Acts chapter 5 verses 3 and 4. Okay, can somebody read that please? Acts 5 verses 3 and 4. Then Peter said, Ananias, how is it? Is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at, at your disposal? What made you think of doing such a thing? You have not let Light. light just to humans be but to God. Okay. So here, uh, I like all of you to follow through with your notes and to follow through with the Bible. Others, it can be very boring. If you sit and just listen to the lecture, it can be very boring, sleepy. You can go out of your mind. But if you follow your the Bible, follow the like, notes, write notes, uh, it will just help you to keep your mind in class. Okay, so here in Acts chapter 5, it's talking about what or whom? What narrative is it talking about here? Who is it talking about here in Acts chapter 5? Okay, the Holy Spirit. It's talking about a couple called Ananias and Sapphira. And it's basically talking about the early church, right? So Ananias and Sapphira, they sell a plot of land which belongs to them okay but they keep up some of money for themselves and they come and give the rest of the money to and uh, to uh to peter okay so first ananias comes the man comes and then what does peter tell him in verse um um three is, yeah, what does he say in verse 3? You don't have to read it, but what does he say? Paraphrase it. How much you sold the... You, why have you lied to the Holy Spirit? How does, uh, how does Peter know that they are lying? The Holy Spirit reveals to him. So we see the Holy Spirit reveals the heart and the mind of God to us. So here, Ananias keeps back a certain sum of money. He brings a certain sum of money and lays his apostles' feet. Peter's ignorant about all of these things. But he says, hey, why have you kept certain portion of the money back? You have lied to the Holy Spirit. And then look at what he says in verse 4. You know, you have lied not to men but to God. So he says in verse 3, you have lied to the Holy Spirit. And in verse 4, he says you have lied to God. So basically attributing Holy Spirit as God. Okay. Are you all able to understand? Yes? No? Yes? 
can hear only one or two S's. All of you with me, okay? So here we see that, you know, the Holy Spirit is attributed to as God as well, okay? So the Holy Spirit is God, okay? We look at another verse in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Uh, we already read this verse, okay, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, where it's attributing the Holy Spirit to as the eternal spirit, okay? We read this verse before. So Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, it says, through the eternal spirit offered himself, okay? So who's the eternal spirit? The Holy Spirit. And why is the Holy Spirit mentioned as eternal spirit? Because he's God. He's eternal. He has no beginning, has no end. Okay. Another nature of God that uh, we have to prove, if we prove that the Holy Spirit is God, is that he is sovereign. Okay. What is the meaning of sovereign? When we say God is sovereign, what do we mean? What do we mean by when we say God is sovereign? He reigns alone, okay? He alone is in authority. What else is the meaning of sovereign? He does what he wills. He does what he pleases. He is sovereign. He is supreme authority. There's no one, uh, uh, an authority figure apart from him, okay? So we look at... Um, and prove that the Holy Spirit is sovereign. We read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 6 and verse 11. So can one of you please read 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Somebody who's not read, ladies, can you give it to her? The winner, you can give the person behind you. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6 and 11. There are diversities of activity, but the same God who works all in all. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as spirits. Unity and diversity in one body. Okay, so he's, it's saying here that the spirit, of, you know, is sovereign. How do we know he's sovereign here? Because he decides what gift of the spirit to release to whom, when. Okay, now you learn about the gift of the spirit. But very briefly to mention here, for you to understand, when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, what do we receive? When we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, what do we receive? What do we receive when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit? Sorry, power, yes. What else? We receive the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. So do some of them receive all the nine, some of them receive five, some of them receive four, some of them receive three, some of them receive two? What do you all think? As he wills, he gives. Okay, this verse says, as he wills, he gives. But when we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, do we all receive all the nine gifts? Or do we receive two, one, nine, five, four, three, two? All the gifts. Okay. When we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, we not only receive power to, you know, to manifest God's power, uh, you know, power and do signs, miracles, and wonders, but we also receive all the nine gifts. So each one of us receive all the nine gifts. Then what does this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Okay, what is this verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 12? Verses verse 6 says, and there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works in all, and um, uh, but the manifestation, verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And verse 11 says, but one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. 
So what is the meaning of that? Please follow through in your Bible when I'm reading, please, everyone, all of you. Okay, so what does verse 11 say? It says, the Holy Spirit distributes to each one individually as he wills. So here it says he wills, which means he's sovereign. Whatever he wills, he does. So what does it mean here? It means that not that he gives some nine gifts, some five, some four, some three, no. When we are baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, we are filled with all the nine gifts. But what does this verse say? He, whatever he wills, he gives. That means when you are ministering to someone, okay, what is the best gift that is, should be released at that time is what the Holy Spirit gives to you. All the nine gifts are there inside you, resident inside you. But what are the gifts that you need to operate out of? Whether it's gifts of healing, gifts of faith, working of miracles, um, uh, the word of wisdom, word of knowledge, word of prophecy. What is the gift that is relevant as you are praying for that person, that occasion, that situation is what the Holy Spirit will release at that moment. Now, when you go to pray for the next person, it can be totally different gifts that you need. So the Holy Spirit at that time will release the gifts that is necessary to minister to that specific person. So whatever he wills to release out of your life, out of the nine gifts, he will release in that specific moment. Are you all able to understand? Don't worry. If you didn't understand, it's okay. You will study about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and all of these will come to better clarity. Okay? So we see that here the Holy Spirit is sovereign, which means he knows what gift to release when in and through your life. What are the combination of gifts to release through your life when, in what situation, and that he will release. Okay? Everyone with me able to understand? Yes? No? Okay. Okay, thank you. So we'll move on. Or do you think we should stop here? Is it too much for all of you? Yes? No? Okay, we'll stop here. Okay, but we have around uh, 12 minutes. So what, what I wanted to do is, I'm going to stop here. What I wanted to do is, I wanted to look at your notes. Okay, I wanted to read through your notes, read the passages, and understand all that has been taught so far. Okay, and then if you have any questions, you will ask. So please, all of you, Open up your notes. It's important to take notes when you're when we are teaching so that it's additional understanding information. So I want all of you to now look at your notes, study, and if you have any doubts, please ask. Okay. We'll stop here. Online students, you can do the same. If you have any questions, you can post it in the chat section. All of you, I want all of you to please open up your notes, please. Yes. Read. Open up your Bibles. Look at the scripture passages and read. And if you didn't understand anything, please feel free to ask. Yes. Um, so we can see the Trinity is working even in our everyday prayer life. And Trinity is working... Um, in every situation. Aspect of our lives, yes. So it is wrong to strongly emphasis only on one person head of God. Yes. Like only Christ, only Father, or no Father, no Son, only Holy Spirit. Yes. It's important that we, uh, you know, uh, give the same uh, glory, honor, um, worship, admiration, uh, praise to all the three persons in the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Each one of them are God. Each one of them deserve our praise, our worship, our glory and honor, our respect. And one of the most 
the, the person in the Trinity that is most neglected, not worshipped, not attributed as God, not given that reverence is the Holy Spirit. So that is why we are studying about the Holy Spirit. We can uh, we can give that glory and honor to Jesus because of what he has done on the cross and who he is. Uh, for the Father, because of fear and reverence out of, you know, who we read about in the Old, Old Testament. But yes, the Holy Spirit, the most misunderstood person, the Trinity. So it's important for us. Why are we studying that the Holy Spirit is God? Why are we studying that about the personality of the Holy Spirit to understand that, hey, He's not some wind. He's not some force. He's not just some power of God, but he is God. And so it's important for us to even worship the Holy Spirit, adore him, give him the glory and honor that is due and the respect that is due to him. Yes. Now, we also see in the Bible that God is a God of order. Yes. That we see from Genesis 1 itself. He created everything in order. Yes. So, uh, our God is a God of order, God of clarity, and He doesn't cause any confusion. Mm -hmm. uh, so, my, my uh, and He doesn't cause any disturbance. Mm -hmm. uh, and in in some some churches where uh, I've uh, got a privilege to minister in some churches, and uh, when I start leading worship, like people just start jumping and uh, they they go around. They even fall on people, uh, like it's disturbing to other people who are worshiping God. Yes. So, and uh, they say it's Holy Spirit. Yes. And uh, maybe I don't know. Like maybe God is we can. The one of the arguments they give is uh, we can't put God in a box. Yes. And when we say that, we also have to be careful. Like everything and anything can't be God. Yes. So God has a certain way of how he functions and he has given his word to confirm it and from. So they say uh, that's the work of the Holy Spirit, jumping around and disturbing others uh, in that process. So uh, how do we justify that? And uh, uh, also saying that only when you function in this gift, only then you are filled with the Holy Spirit. Sorry. I think that's all uh, just strong misinterpretation, understanding about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. But if you look at the Holy Spirit, why does the Holy Spirit come as a dove on Jesus? Why? Why does the Holy Spirit come as a dove? Why didn't God choose something else? Dove represents peace. Peace and gentle, a very gentle son. So if a dove is sitting on your shoulder, how will you move? very gently very cautiously okay you don't want to disturb that dove okay so what is it saying you see everything in the bible everything that god does is very symbolic we need to look at it in symbolic terms interpret it and understand it, it means the holy spirit is a very gentle person okay so if you want to really uh, you know know or if you want to uh, understand what god is revealing to you the heart and mind and the plan and will of the god of god it's important for you to be very calm and composed and gentle because the holy spirit comes with a very gentle voice even moses he says to god show me your glory there was a wind was ripping up the sun then there was just this just gentle this one right so god is very gentle comes what's happening here comes in a very gentle way so you know for, so if, if you want to listen to the Holy Spirit, you need to be very calm, composed. So if your very mind is very cluttered, very anxious, very, um, you know, you're going through that stress and all of that, you will not be, you will miss hearing the Holy Spirit. So if you want to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying when you're ministering, don't get irritated by people, don't get irritated by the sound and the noise and the sound system and the worship. You need to be very calm and composed and listen to the holy spirit so all of these are manifestations where they think hey if you're jumping around son people are thinking you're you know you're being filled with power i basically think when people jump around and make noise and confusion is the evil spirit the evil spirit is a disturbing spirit it disturbs right it's not a very calm composed spirit so when when you see somebody disturbing in the in the congregation you know the holy spirit is manifest the sorry the demonic spirit is manifesting and then you take and rebuke 
those spirits because it's a disturbing spirit. Uh, for Saul, God sent a disturbing spirit that disturbed him, right? Yes. Did I answer your question? Yeah. So there are two questions here. Jeevan says, when mentioning the Trinity, we always go through Christ, right? In the name of Christ, we thank God and seek help from the Holy Spirit. Even though the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit are all God, we always place Christ at the center of the Trinity, right? Yeah, because we are able to understand Jesus because he came and lived as one amongst us, you know, as a human being, revealed himself. But also people really uh, understand Trinity with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, they more often refer to us Jesus because Jesus is someone who came, walked on the earth, became one like us, revealed himself, modeled himself. Saubhagya, where does, last, last question, where does the Holy Spirit stay inside us, whether in our heart or belly? In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, verse it says, Behold, I knock at the door of your heart. In another chapter, 738 says, Out of the belly flows rivers of living water. Where, what does it actually say? Now, wherever you read in the Bible, New Testament, Old Testament, wherever it talks about belly, wherever it talks about heart, it's all, it talks about your inner person, basically referring to your inner person. Okay, so that is the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit dwells inside you, but in the heart or your belly, the belly is talking about your inner person. So it's basically there. But don't worry where he's staying, whether in your stomach, intestines, large intestines, small intestine, where the Holy Spirit is just dwelling in you. That is more important than where. <laughs> okay, I hope I answered that question. Okay, thank you everyone uh, for this class. I uh, will see you uh, next Friday. Have a good um, day and a good weekend. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, no, please don't clap. <laughs> no clapping, you know. Thank you. Thank you.